You may be seated. Uh, that's all right, all right, Noreen. I can relate. Uh, the technology can relate. You can relate. <laughs> Thank God God is with it, right? <laughs> uh, all right, let's have a word of prayer. Uh, gracious Heavenly Father, uh, thank you for your eternal presence again, and we thank you for being our God and for being our strength and an ever-present help in times of trouble. Uh, thank you, Lord, that uh, you're always with it. Thank you that you always know what's going on. Uh, thank you that you know every thought, uh, every circumstance in our lives, every condition uh, that comes upon our heart each and every day. Uh, thank you that you have reached down uh, to touch each and every one of us. Uh, thank you for the gift of faith uh, that we would be here uh, to believe. Uh, thank you uh, that you um, touched our hearts to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, the Word of God, uh, the gospel of our salvation. And uh, so great a Savior, so great a a gospel, uh, so great a word from heaven. And yet, Lord, uh, we uh, fail consistently, uh, constantly. Uh, we forget your word. Uh, we forget to look heavenward. Uh, not all the time, but at times, and it's during those times where we get anxious, we find ourselves in trouble. And uh, thank you uh, that you bid us to come as a a uh, parent does their children, and thank you that your arms are so wide open when we sin, when we fall short, when we lack faith. Uh, you're always there uh, to encourage us, to pick us up, to, uh, to, in, uh, to bless us, and even in our weakness, uh, where you seem to show up uh, the most, and uh, we find that amazing. Uh, in our weakness, you're made strong. And we pray that you, um, despite the weaknesses here this morning and all, that, uh, all the problems with the technology, and uh, we just pray that uh, in, in the weakness this morning, Lord, that you would be made strong and that you would visit in a very, very special way. Um, we also pray that you would touch Martha, uh, as she looks at the slide presentation, uh, may you just fill her heart with all the wonderful thoughts that those pictures contain. And uh, may th that fullness in her heart uh, overflow to the congregation, that your Holy Spirit would move in our hearts, that we would uh, catch uh, the, 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 the vision of that ministry with the college, uh, her ministry through the years with the people, uh, that we uh, would perhaps even capture the possibilities of uh, our own ministry and sharing Christ and the gospel with uh, the people in our world. Uh, so we, uh, we pray that you would uh, use that time to, to touch her and to touch us. Uh, lift up our church family today, O oh God, a lot of needs in our church family. And it's our prayer um, that the people that are struggling physically would not get discouraged, that they would sense your presence, that you would give them a peace uh, as they wait upon you, whether you bring healing or you take them home. We pray that you would give them a tremendous peace. And Father, last but not least, uh, we pray for our nation. Uh, we, we love our country, Lord. Uh, we thank you for your hand being upon this great nation. And yet our hearts break uh, to see what's unfolding. Uh, lawlessness, wickedness, uh, departure um, like we haven't seen in so, uh, and since the inception of this country. Um, just mind-boggling, uh, demonic to the core. And you're the only one that can help. You're the only one that can right the ship and turn things around. Uh, we pray for those who are in government, whether it's from the federal down to the local communities. Uh, we pray that there would be a thirst for God, uh, that uh, you would pour out your spirit, Lord, and bring revival uh, in such a way where there would be a tremendous thirst for God in people 
in leadership would, would bow down, uh, give themselves to you, and uh, create laws that would honor you, uh, that there, there would be a return to the God of heaven. And uh, because, Lord, we're, we're lost with, without your, your doing that. And um, we see some very, very dark days, Father, so I pray that you would, uh, you would honor our prayers here that, uh, today, uh, prayers across the country for our nation, and uh, that uh, we would see you move in such a mighty, mighty way. Again, we uh, thank you for this time. We offer up all these prayers in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, our uh, first scripture reading. Okay. This morning's first scripture reading is from the Old Testament from the book of Psalms. Be reading the 134th Psalm. And I believe it's on page 561 in the New Church Bible. Again, the 134th Psalm. Behold, bless the Lord, all servants of the Lord, who serve by night in the house of the Lord. Lift up your hands to the sanctuary and bless the Lord. May the Lord bless you from Zion, he who made heaven from earth. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. Our second reading this morning is from Paul's second letter to the Thessalonians. It's the second chapter, verses 13 through 17, and that's found beginning on page 3, excuse me, 1068 of the Church Bible. But we should always give thanks to God for you, brethren beloved by the Lord, because God has chosen you from the beginning for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and faith in the truth. It was for this he called you through our gospel, that you may gain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So then, brethren, stand firm and hold to the traditions which you were taught, whether by word of mouth or by letter from us. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father who has loved us and given us eternal comfort and good hope by grace, comfort and strengthen your hearts in every good work and word. This is the word of our Lord. What a great passage of scripture. So Martha, um, welcome. Uh, how long have you been a missionary to the Navajo people? 39 years. That's a long time, right? Long time. Uh, constant, faithful. Uh, God bless you for that. So uh, anyway, we're looking forward to what you share. Okay? It's all yours. Sorry, we couldn't get the uh, slide presentation working, but I'll tell you what's on the slides, and I probably can set this up afterwards so and have it scrolling through if I can remember how to do that so you can get a glimpse of it. Um, First, I wanted to give you greetings from Indian Bible College of Flagstaff, Arizona. And just to clarify, it's not Phoenix. Uh, most people think all of Arizona is Phoenix because that's all you ever hear on the news. But actually, we're at 7,000 feet. It's usually cooler there than here in the summer. But this summer has been hot there, too. So I don't know. No way to get away from it. I wanted to thank you, first off for your support. This church, I believe, has supported me since the very beginning, so for 39 years you have stood by me, and thank you for that. Our mission statement of Indian Bible College is that we exist to disciple and educate indigenous 
Native Christians for lifetimes of biblical ministry and spiritual leadership to their people and the world. We debated on which to put first, whether disciple or educate, because we are an educational institution, but we decided to put disciple first, and I think that will become evident why we chose that as we go on here. The vision of Indian Bible College is to see Native America cease to be the mission field and cease to see themselves as the mission field, and the Native Church mobilized to send missionaries all over the world. It seems as if anywhere a Native person goes, in Europe, in uh, South America, people want to know about them as Native Americans. They're fascinated by their background, by their history, and there are tribal peoples all over the world. I wasn't aware of that until fairly recently. Whether you go to uh, Saudi Arabia or uh, India, there are tribal peoples that are there, and they want to know the history of Native Americans. So Native Americans have this wide open door that we will never have. When they come into a country and they're Christians, they have this opportunity that is unprecedented. Did you know that IBC is the only non-denominational Bible college for Native Americans in the United States? There were several others in the past, but they've all folded, except for, I think it's two Assembly of God schools and one Nazarene college. We are the only one without a denominational backing, which Jason says is a miracle of God that we are still in existence but it's partly because of you. In fact, it's because of all of the yous all over the country who continue to support us and keep us going. We um, have recently started supplementing Native staff to allow them to pursue further schooling, and I'll talk more about Native staff shortly. We also require our students to graduate debt-free. I don't know of any other institution like that, but if they don't pay their bills first, they get this little piece of paper with an emoji that says pay their bill. They don't get their diplomas. They'll get them when they pay their bill. <clears throat> this past semester, I believe, was the first time that I know of that we had about 80% of the students who were paid up when it came to graduation. So we're making some progress there. We had 21 full-time students this past semester and a total of 40 students, so that means we had 19 that were either taking one or two classes in person or were online. We had students that represented nine different distinct tribes or ethnic groups, and in the history of the school, we've had 57 different tribes or ethnicities represented. Our main focus is disciple making, making disciples who will disciple others, as it talks about in 2 Timothy 2. So what is happening at IBC? Well, the need has not changed. The need continues to be great. Native American reservations are still very dark and troubled places. I don't know how many of you have cruised across a reservation, but I would recommend it. I found out there's one in Massachusetts. It's four and a half acres large. Uh, it's in Grafton. So I'm investigating these things. I had no idea there was, but there is a reservation in Massachusetts. Uh, most reservations you'll find are places of a lot of demonic activity, and it's usually blatant demonic activity, not so much like what we see in our culture. I think our culture, we still have demonic activity, and the pastor referred to that in his prayer, but we don't see it as up front. It's more subtle. It's quieter, which maybe is more dangerous because we don't remember that we're dealing with demonic forces. But the spiritual void is greater than ever. And one of, those, one of the reasons for that is COVID. During COVID, you may have heard on the news that the Navajo Nation was one of the hardest hit. But they say the Navajo Nation had more people affected and who died as a result of COVID than New York City, that it was one of the highest rates in the world. Why, I'm not sure, but that has created a spiritual void that's even greater than what there was. Uh, it's estimated that about 30 Native evangelical leaders have passed away. 
But there's a part of me that's excited because those guys were hanging on to their pulpits. They were refusing to change, and their churches are dying. Some of them are already dead. But now there's this opportunity for a whole new movement, and there are young guys ready to take on the pastorate. And now perhaps they can step up. So one of the themes that I've been rehearsing to myself for about two years now is that Satan meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. He always brings good out of evil. He turns it around. Amen. So some of the effects of COVID, we continued to have classes in person for all but two months. In March of 2020, the CDC told us to shut down. So we did, sort of. We went online. Uh, we took three weeks off. One of those weeks was already designated as spring break. Another week was designated as the ministry trip. And we took an extra week to get our act together and figure out how to do everything online. We continued to do according to the schedule. So the students just logged in from wherever they were. Most of them stayed on campus, so they were in their dorm rooms. And I was really amazed. They continued to log in. We had, I had two students who went back to Pennsylvania, and one of them was in my night class, which meant he was logging in at 9 o'clock at night, and our, our uh, class finished up at midnight his time. But he continued to faithfully log in, even though he's working full-time at that point. So I praise God for the students' faithfulness in that. There wasn't nearly as much faithfulness in turning assignments, but uh, hopefully we'll make up for that in the years to come. Uh, also, well, I'll get to that, I guess. <clears throat> we moved, um, oh, we had two campus outbreaks. We had an outbreak in the summer of 2020, about, oh, maybe... Ten of the students, all the men's dorm, came down with COVID. But all of them did fine. They came through it well, and they're all up and running again. We had one woman who came down with COVID, and she was the only one that really struggled. She had some serious complications, but no one ended up in the hospital, and no one passed away, and I think they pretty much recovered. Then we had a second outbreak in March of this year, in which myself, the president, his whole family, his wife, the uh, academic dean, no, not ac academic dean, uh, admissions counselor, and uh, let's see, there was one other staff member, oh, uh, dean of students, plus about six students all came down with COVID. I looked at the statistics for the county that, that week and saw that we were about half the county. <laughs> but again, God brought us through it. And uh, we continued with classes. We did shut down again and go online for one week. I personally went online for two weeks because it took me a while to get back into the groove of things. And I did actually disappear for a couple of days as the fever took over. <clears throat> we moved some events outside trying to help the students keep safe. Uh, we moved our chapels outside when the weather started warming up. We moved our um, commencement exercises outside, which was interesting. The day before we had commencement, the winds were clocked at 70 miles an hour. The day of commencement, it was much better. It was only 20 or 30 miles an hour. So <laughs> it was an interesting day, chasing programs and uh, grabbing hats and things like that, but it brought some humor. So God provided for us to be able to continue and not quit. Some of the effects of COVID are that now we have a new vision for online learning. We're calling it online synchronous learning, where unlike the classes I have taken, I've taken lots of online classes, and I have never tapped into a class that was actually in session. And that's what we're doing. We're um, telling the students they can apply for this class, and they take one class, we did it, uh, experimented with one night class, and we had a good response. I think 15, 16 different students came from Oklahoma, Washington State, uh, New Mexico, and Arizona. So 
it was a good response to that, and now we know how to do it. We're into community. That's one of our basic um, emphases. So to do online without being in the classroom is just not the way we want to do it. And we discovered we can do this, and it works. We did have difficulty in student recruitment because there were no meetings, no conferences, no high school meeting together. But this week, and if you think of it, this week, Daniel and Corrine are recruiting. There are 450 Native youth meeting in Illinois for a um, what they call a Warrior Leadership Summit with Ron Hutchcraft Ministries. And that's one of our biggest opportunities for recruitment. So pray this week that God would send in 10 to 15 new freshmen because we didn't get, we got five new freshmen last year. That's not enough to maintain. We had to adjust the ministry immersion trip in 2020. Instead of going on their normal trip, we ended up recruiting students to help us because some of us on staff were helping with relief efforts on the reservations. And they some of them joined us. <clears throat> they allowed us to use the funds they had raised. <clears throat> Excuse me. And uh, we continued by it that way. This year, we did another adjusted ministry trip. The students went to Broken Arrow Bible Ranch, where you may remember is where I was for 10 years. And they prepped the camp for, this, for the uh, incoming campers. The camp is now about to start its fourth week of camp. They have a shortened year, but they are in full swing again, and IBC helped get that started. <clears throat> IBC is about leadership development. It's about creating disciples. And I have a, a picture. You can't see it from there, I don't think, but there is a picture of our current Native staff, and I'll, it'll be on the computer afterward, too, I hope. We now have eight, or at least when we took this picture, we had eight Native staff. The last time I came, we had two. So God has greatly increased that. We've discovered that the best way to get staff members who understand who we are and what we're about and who are qualified is to choose them from the student body. So all of these Native staff have graduated from Indian Bible College, and all of them are working full-time as staff right now. Daniel and Corrine are the first two. They were the ones that were on staff when I was here last. Daniel's been on staff since 2007 as the admissions counselor. We never had an admissions counselor before. He, he was the first one. He took and ran with that, and he is still running. And he and his wife are recruiting as hard and as fast as they can right today. He married a Seneca woman at Daniel's Navajo. Uh, Corrine became his wife uh, 10 years ago, I believe. And Corrine is helping him right now with recruitment. Normally, she is the dean of women, or she still is, I guess, but she's not functioning in that role right now. Um, Corrine graduated in 2013 with a bachelor's and has been on staff since 2011. Deidre is uh, another one who's come on staff just recently. She's Hopi. She already had a bachelor's degree from Arizona State University in nutrition, and she came to Indian Bible College to get her bachelor's in Bible. But before she could finish, we took her and asked if she could become staff, which she did. She still wants to finish her bachelor's in um, Bible, but right now she's working on a master's in um, library science, I believe it is, to help us with our Learning Resource Center. I forgot to mention, too, that Corrine just recently started a master's in counseling, and we're helping, helping them with the expenses of that. Joshua Ortiz is another one. He graduated in 2018 with his bachelor's, and he's the current director of work since 2018. He's working on a master's in uh, business, Oh, and Joshua and Deidre have decided to start dating, which is kind of exciting. Lucky and Lenora Bigman are Navajo. They are, they both graduated somewhat, um, none, neither one with a bachelor's yet, but they are both hoping to. Lucky has come on as of 2018 as the new 
or 2019 as the new business administrator, and Lenora, who is also Navajo, uh, graduated, graduated in 2018 with her associates and wants to continue, but she's currently the executive assistant to the president since 2019. Then there's Amy. Amy is White Mountain Apache. She graduated in 2015 and came on staff since in 2016. She's done a number of things, but she, eventually she ended up as the registrar. Honestly, I had her in classes and I didn't think she'd be a good registrar, but she surprised me. Uh, Amy helped get us through accreditation. She got a vision for what we were doing and what she could do and showed her stuff. She's one smart woman. I wish she'd done it in her classes. <laughs> but Amy told us she'd give us two years, and that was four years ago. So it's this summer that she's given us the ultimatum that she's going back to her people, the White Mountain Apache, and working with youth. She's already been accepted with, with Apache Youth Ministries and will be leaving in August. However, we just stole another student who is a current student, and Brina is taking over from her. She's already started and uh, will be full-time, well, full-time, part-time register, registrar in uh, the fall, as well as a full-time student. Jamie Covington is Spokane. She graduated in 2019 and came on as a student life assistant in 2019. She also told us that her vision is to go back to her people and to be a light in the Spokane nation. So while she was doing student life ministry, she was also doing an internship at a coffee shop in Flagstaff. And her plan is to also leave IBC in August and go back to her people and open a coffee shop, Lord willing. So in 2019, we had a handoff of one, two, three different, four different uh, students who took over jobs that were being done by non-native people. And I think that's the first time in history that's happened and it's given us a vision for what we can do in the future. Uh, IBC has three initiatives, expansion, accreditation, and extension. Expansion, we've been purchasing other, v under, other uh, facilities. We purchased the barn, we call it. It's an administrative building now quite a few years ago and we still had a we had a balloon payment due this year but God graciously during COVID sent in two very large unexpected gifts and we paid that barn off and now we are completely debt free as an institution we also purchased a couple of years ago and there's a, a really cool story behind that but I won't share that right now uh, two buildings, it's actually two buildings plus a, a large shed plus a small shed plus a parking lot for $750,000 from the Salvation Army. And that has been an amazing opportunity. We've completely gutted the buildings, turned one of them into our library, which is, I am proud and grateful to bring people on a tour. I used to, I'd get to our library, I'd kind of say, and eh, that's our library with embarrassment. It was a terrible place. <laughs> this is a beautiful place, uh, modern and light, and, and uh, God is using Deidre to expand the collection and organize it better. And then there's the um, student center that's a larger building connected to what is now the library, and we can turn it into a chapel on Tuesdays and Thursdays. We turn it into a cafeteria after chapel on Tuesdays and Thursdays, and then we wrap things up put the chairs in a corner, and it becomes the student lounge with, uh, let's see, a number of different games, uh, pool tables there, there's screens for them to do their video games or whatever they want to do. So that has been a huge asset, and it's completely paid for. In extension, I made reference to the fact that we learned how to do synchronous online classes, and that is something we intended to continue to do going forward and offer a Christian ministry certificate, which is just core classes for people in ministry. Accreditation. I didn't mention accreditation. I don't know what I said. But accreditation was granted 
finally, after seven years of work, in February of 2021. So we are now an accredited institution. What do I do? Uh, mostly the same things I've been doing. I'm still the music department for the school, and now I'm also the missions department since I finished another master's in um, missions, which was the funnest mi uh, course I've ever taken. Uh, I'm instructor of the history of North America, which we do with a Native American emphasis, and it's tailor-made for whoever's in the class. Personal finance, I'm team teaching. I'm teaching piano, guitar, and voice when there's no COVID around. And Christ and culture, I'm also team teaching. I'm the alumni director, still trying to figure that one out, life coach director, the school editor, and uh, the IBC museum curator. We don't have a museum. That means I have to create it in order to curate it. So pray for us. Pray for increased enrollment. Pray for the, the uh, recruitment efforts right now that are going on today in Illinois. Pray for the graduates from 2021. We only had two bachelors. And I just heard this past week that uh, Carly is going to stay on <laughs> and work as a semi-staff while she's continuing to um, pay off her car and do other things. So she's going to work as a student um, uh, residential assistant in the dorm for the women. Staffing needs, we still need no, more Native staff, but it's difficult to find qualified Native staff who, who can serve without being paid. We need an IT director, and I have someone in mind for that, but I don't know if that's in God's mind or just my mind. Financial needs, we continue to need support for Native staff in particular who can't really go out to their churches like I could and ask for people to support them because they don't even support their pastors, never mind a missionary. So uh, facilities and expansion. Now we own on one block, we own the barn on one side and the uh, student resource center and library on the other side of the block, and then there's this small building that houses two apartments between us, between the two buildings, or three buildings. So still some expansion to go, but we need more students to justify that. So if you want further information, we do have a Facebook page. If you Google Indian Bible College, or we have a fantastic website that Daniel keeps updated, and if that's found at indianbible.org. It's not too hard to remember. And there's some information here in the front. I also have my own website at mmol, that stands for mymissionaryonline.org slash gushy. So that's all I had for you. I'd be happy to talk to you afterward. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Thanks, Martha. Uh, well, so we got, we got through that without the slides, huh? Yeah, see, how does that work, right? So uh, a, a couple of things that I just wanted to share here. Um, so I was listening to you share about COVID. It's been a real challenging year f for a lot of people. Um, and yet we've gotten through that too. Uh, also, I, uh, Harold's not with us, but years ago, Harold and his sisters drove out west all across the country. I may have shared this with you, but... Harold drove through a reservation, and uh, he said there were ap it was absolutely worse than our inner cities. Now, you've seen pictures of the inner cities. I mean, we're talking about dilapidated sections of the inner city. And Harold said that all those people that live in the inner city ought to drive through a reservation, and they'll greatly appreciate what they have. Something to think about. Uh, the other thing is, I, I stand corrected, but I said your work for the, with the Navajo for 39 years is actually way more than just the Navajo. You mentioned the Hopi, uh, indigenous, so all Indian people, right? Uh, and you're, I, I don't know how you do what you do. Uh, you have, wear a lot of different hats. So... Think about this. If you have one gift, you're very gifted in that one gift, right? But Martha's got to multitask 
you know, you people that are multitaskers, that's a lot of balls for her to juggle, so you want to definitely pray for her. The other thing I was thinking of, too, is the last time you were here, it, it always seems like that the uh, college is adding stuff and growing. And uh, it's, I know it's slow, but I was thinking of the mustard seed. It starts out small. A lot of God's work starts out small, and it grows into something really beautiful. Finally, a couple of things I want to... Do you see that poster over there? I looked at train your mind, follow the truth. And I just want to say a couple things about, about that. Because that is beyond Indian Bible College. You talk about training the mind today. They don't, they don't teach people to think today, do they? Everything's cookie cutter. God, the Bible, God teaches us to think. You want to be a thinker. You don't want to just follow what, you know, everybody wants to tell you how to do it or what to do. They don't teach you how to think today. It's so, so important to, to learn to think. How many times do you come across Scripture where it talks about strengthening your heart and your mind? Uh, renew the mind. Now, I always say this, but it's so true. Isn't the battle always in the mind? Because that's where, that's, that's Satan's battlefield. That's where he goes at us all the time. So it's so, so important to, to think properly, to be trained to think. Renew the mind because the battle's there. And despite, we, we have the mind of Christ, but his mind still needs to be developed in, within our hearts, is, does, it, does it not? Uh, the other thing is follow the truth here. Uh, I've been thinking about this. <laughs> I just wrote some thoughts down. But um, Christ is the truth. That's a rare jewel today to follow the truth. There's a lot of people that are not following the truth today, are they? They don't follow the Word of God. They don't follow Christ. They may, they may say that they follow Christ, but they're not disciples of Christ. Culturally, uh, the social pressure to conform... To not follow truth? I mean, you see it. Uh, I mean, where, where is it all going? Uh, and I think a relevant question here is, as Christians in this culture and in this society, if we're going to follow the truth, that means standing up for it. That means speaking your mind and, 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 and not... And not being apologetic at all for what the Word of God says. And, and you know, today they, we talk about cancel culture. They want to cancel everything. Uh, we are living in a day and age of lawlessness. And, and it just it's kind of the crescendo up to the man of sin and lawlessness. And I, you know, think, of where, where are we going to individually or as a church or as the church, where are we going to stand in all that? I think that's a very, very relevant question. You know, because people, t today, people don't want to speak out, stand up, get involved. They don't want to share truth because they're going to be excoriated for it, canceled for it, shamed for it. I, we're, you know, I think we're living in a seminal moment at a crossroads in our society where it's, it, it's almost, you know, put up or shut up. And I think that's what people are going to be forced to do. You know, uh, finally, um, I think that there, I think God says there's great reward in following the truth, isn't there? It being the truth, following the truth, going after the truth. I mean, digging for it. Uh, that's where we're at today, folks. Uh, you, you know, you've, you've heard me preach on, you've seen it where churches are embracing all sorts of lawlessness because it's expediently, um, I, I don't know, I guess, I guess they see it as, you know, great for their church to conform. Uh, that's not what God's called us to do. God's called us to be different, to stand out, speak up uh, as a badge of honor, wear Christ on your sleeve. 
very, very, be very, very vocal. And, I, and, and so that's what, uh, that's what I wanted to share with you to wrap things up. Um, you know, um, Martha, you're a missionary for 39 years. I've been a missionary here, going on, what, 33? You've been a missionary for as long as you've been saved. Now, you haven't gone to maybe Arizona. Maybe you haven't moved 300 miles like I did. But you're, you're a missionary, and, and you're a missionary every single day. Uh, I've said this, you may not have this pulpit, but you do have a pulpit, right? Wherever you go, you shine your light. You have a great, great opportunity uh, to train your mind, follow the truth. So those, those, are, those are timeless principles that come right out of the Word of God. And anyway, that's what God has uh, uh, laid upon my heart this morning. Uh, Martha, I appreciate you coming. Uh, you're always welcome. You're always very gracious. I appreciate you coming, and we're glad you made it here today. Uh, anybody want to ask Martha any questions or why, why we have her here? Oh, yes, Drew. Come on up here. Yeah. <laughs> if I knew that, Drew, <laughs> I'd be more effective than I am, I think. One thing I think might help is, and you're right, there are people out there that are as ignorant as Native people, for sure. Uh, starting with creation, perhaps. Uh, I, we, we do a lot of emphasis on stories. Stories are really important. And stories are something everyone loves. I'm addicted to stories. And most people, I think, really enjoy a story. So starting, that's what God did. He started from creation, and he told us stories all the way through the scriptures. So I, I think relationship uh, takes time. I'm uh, working with my neighbor right now, just being a friend to her. She's a sweet woman but she's into Hinduism and Buddhism, I think. Uh, she's never told me that, but I see it in her house. So we'll see how far I can go with her if, if God allows me to have those opportunities. It's a great question. You could probably spend weeks answering that. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Any yeah. other questions for Martha? Like what she does in her spare time. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else? What is a typical day like for you, Martha? Or, or is each day different? Do you have a, a typical day? Yes, each day is unique. Uh, my long days are Tuesdays, or they were this past semester when I had a night class. So I'd be at school by 8 o'clock, and I would leave school at 8.30 p.m., that was the long day, but most days are not that long, and I'd come in late on Wednesdays, which I didn't used to do, but I'm getting old, so <laughs> I'll take that comp time that I have coming to me. So Wednesdays, I come in by 10 to teach personal finance and leave by 5. So it's, it's a, a variety, which is really fun. It's, it's not like I sit at the computer all day, except during uh, breaks. Sometimes I, I will working on uh, accreditation documents and things. I really enjoyed that. that was, I, I'd love to write, and even those kind of academic things was, was fun to try to make the school look as good as I could without stretching anything, without being totally honest, and that kind of thing. So I usually, at least every week, have some time that I spend on editing. But again, it's, it's fun. I feel a little guilty, like, I get to do this. <laughs> and, each, each day is unique. Are you the longest tenured person there? I am the longest tenured. I'm almost the oldest one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Bob is the oldest, and he's, uh, 
he retired from the Forest Service and then he turned over his job as bus business administrator to Lucky this year, but he didn't leave. He stepped down as a office manager and humbly took that position. So he's older than I am by a couple years. <laughs> oh, yes. Are there, is there a language barrier or are there many language barriers? That's a good question too. Are there language barriers? Not generally anymore. In fact, I speak more Navajo than most of the students do. So I don't speak it anymore because it's embarrassing for them. But if something slips out, I'll see how they respond. And generally they, they think it's hilarious. And, uh, <laughs> so then I use it for, for fun. <laughs> but uh, uh, very few, we have two, three students right now who spoke Navajo as their first language, but they're fluent in English, so it's not a problem, but it is fun to use them. They can do unique things that the rest of the students are not capable of, because even though they probably had some background in their original language, they've lost it. We did start a new class, though, just last year, I believe it was, called a language elective where the student can take that elective to learn their language. Uh, they have to connect with the elders back home, and uh, they learn principles of language learning. They learn phrases, so that's been pretty cool to try to get it back so they can communicate with their grandparents. Yes? You just mentioned the word tribal elders. Do they, um, or does that, the teaching of Christianity uh, conflict greatly with the tribal leaders, and does it lead to um, some issues at the college? Not usually issues at the college, but it may in the student's home. Mm -hmm. Or it may be like the Navajo Nation. Right now, their president, Jonathan Nez, is a born-again believer, and the vice president is also a born-again believer. Jonathan Nez spoke at our uh, commencement exercises a few years ago. So I've been praying that God would raise up the Navajo Nation to bring a revival to this country. I thought, now wouldn't that be neat? Could you send some to here in Massachusetts? Because we do have a, a, quite a large Native population, but I don't think that any, well, very few of them are Christian. If, uh... Yes, I think you're right. <laughs> It appears that way. Yeah. We are talking about Massachusetts. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> yeah. Anybody else? Yeah. Yes. 39 years ago, how did you originally get involved in this? Were you recruited or did you search it out or did it just kind of happen? Mm. I grew up in this area. I grew up in Lakeville mostly, a little bit in Middleborough and a little bit in New York and those places. But uh, when I was five, I told my parents I was going to become a missionary to American Indians. I don't know why, I don't know how, but that has been my goal since I was five. So I searched it out. I looked for places to minister. I applied with United Indian Missions first, and they pl placed me at Broken Arrow Bible Ranch in New Mexico. And uh, I worked with a native church there, and the pastor of that church moved to Indian Bible College to be the president and asked me to come with him, and I said, mm, no. But four years later, I did. I followed him over there, and that's how I ended up at Indian Bible College. Martha, my children will want to know, do you still play the guitar? <laughs> I do still play the guitar, and I still teach it. I'm not a great guitarist, but I can do the basics and can teach the basics. My, my son described you as the lady who works with the Indians, but plays the guitar. <laughs> <laughs> the piano is my favorite. And over the years, more recently, I've had opportunity to provide music leadership for a number of churches in the area, which has been kind of fun. It's nothing I ever sought out, but uh, Presbyterian Church recently, a Nazarene church a little while back, and I work at my own church, too. And, which is a, a secret Baptist church. 
It's not the name anymore either. <laughs> Anybody else? Going, going, gone. Thank you, Martha. That's great. Thank you.